I'm Carl Gutowski. I'm a board certified plastic surgeon um, from Chicago. I'll be talking about the different types of techniques uh, used for liposuction. These are my disclosures. It's going to be kind of weeding out some of the fake news versus the facts on the techniques. So what I want to do is talk to you, just one thing, introduce levels of evidence. We had a great talk this morning about the scientific method and the approach and the differences between a good study and a bad study. So I'm going to expound on that a little bit. I'll talk about the types of liposuction and give you a scientific, not an opinion based, but a scientific assessment of the techniques. And then talk about understanding the limitations of liposuction volumes as related to liposuction and lipedema. This has been a great conference. Um, I'm very grateful to be invited here, but I want to tell you a little bit about my background because if you understand my background, you'll see where I'm coming from in my talk. Um, I've been the six years I spent as chair of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Quality and Performance Metrics Committee where we look at how do we evaluate what we do in a safe way, both for reconstructive and cosmetic things. I helped develop and for over 10 years, I was chair of the tracking operations and outcomes and plastic surgery program, which is the largest database of plastic surgery cases in the world. We've got hundreds and thousands of cases. Since we had started that, we've actually been tapping into that database, and I'll present some of the data here, and some of that data has actually been presented in the other talks. And like the death rate from liposuction, which has been often misquoted from studies that are 20 or 30 years old, when you look at our database in the hands of board-certified plastic surgeons, the death rate with general anesthesia extremely low. It's not that one in seven thousand number that's old data we have new data we can back it up I've also been on over 10 years I've spent on the American Society of Plastic Surgeons Patient Safety Committee where we look at this regularly I've done over 3,000 liposuction cases I know that I've treated at least 250 lipedema patients but for the first 10 years in practice I didn't really know I was treating them I knew there was something different about it I just didn't realize these were lipedema patients so I'd have to really go back and look even deeper to find out the true number and I'm also on the editorial board of the uh, leading plastic surgery journal and what does that mean I review papers every day pretty much on whether they're worthy for publication or not so I can pretty much judge whether something is published whether it's really worthy of, of the science or whether it's just some garbage that's coming across. And there, unfortunately, there is a lot of garbage that comes across and it gets published in second and third rate journals, sometimes journals where authors pay to get published. It's hard for you to figure that out, but you really got to weed through some of these things and figure out what you're seeing is published. Is that good science or bad science? Because unfortunately, there's a lot of bad science out there. So these are the levels of evidence. There's very, it's very hard to do a surgery study that's level one, meaning a high quality, randomized, controlled trial or a systematic review. It's just very hard to do that. But that's level one. Level two evidence are lesser quality, randomized, controlled trials or comparative studies. Most of what we see are retrospective comparative studies, but in the lipedema realm, there really aren't any. It's really just case series, and that's level four. That's pretty low level evidence. All it means is, hey, here are my 30 or 40 cases, and it doesn't really help us very much. It's just, here's one person's experience. We don't even have good multi-center uh, multi studies in it. And level five is expert opinion. That's kind of what you get on the internet. Um, and as Abraham Lincoln said, you know, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture of, of someone important there. <laughs> Um, so you know, here's an example. This is a patient sent me these pictures. She was going to go and have this done, and she goes, I want it done with Vaser. And I said, why? She showed me these pictures, and I looked at them. I'm like, that's fine. It, and the, the marketing said this was hot before and after high def laser liposuction treatment with three sessions of Vaser. But when I looked at the pictures, I said, look back here. Notice there's a scar running up and down the back of the leg. Okay, that's I think this patient had a thigh lift, and I think if you think that this is just from Vaser, you're going to be disappointed. And when she looked at those scars, she realized, oh, there's something else going on. So this is one of my patients. Um, someone asked me in the audience, do I operate on obese patients? Well, yeah, I do. That's what I do. Even though there's guidelines about what you can and can't do, I think if I properly select the patients and we have a proper discussion about what can be done, I can take one of these patients and turn her into something that, that, that is much more reasonable. Um, it's a process. And I tell people it's not a one-shot deal or two-shot deal. It's a three-shot deal. And since I'm a plastic surgeon, I can do the liposuction, the debulking, and then I can do the body contouring the excisional surgeries, the body lift, the tummy tuck, and the thigh lift. If you're taking pictures of this talk, go ahead, but if you want, you can go to my 
website and download it and view it in your own leisure too, and I'll give you the address at the end so you don't have to be snapping pictures if you don't, unless you're taking pictures of me, that's okay. <laughs> um, so anyways, it's a process. Um, this case, the middle picture uh, was after two rounds of liposuction, but here's what I did. I had one of my partners help me. I was doing power lipo on one side, that's PAL, and or I th actually, I think he was doing power lipo and I th was doing regular lipo, and there's no difference, right? There, this is what I'm going to kind of tell you in this talk. There's really no difference in all these techniques. But then she really needed a thigh lift to get to the result that, uh, that you finally see there. So let's look at PubMed. PubMed is a da national database of all the published literatures in journals that are tracked by PubMed. If a journal isn't tracked by PubMed, it's probably not very good. So let's look at lipedema. So put, type in lipedema, 183 results as of at least a couple months ago. Look at lipedema treatment, only 114. But say you want lipedema surgery, only 65. Go to lipedema liposuction, 38 papers. Not a lot to go on if we're going to look at evidence-based medicine and try to look at the science on this. And out of those 38, nine of them are really primary studies in liposuction. So here we're talking about this like we know everything about it based on nine studies. Not that much. And then some of those are just reviews of the literature. Doesn't really help us too much. How many comparative studies do we have? Meaning they did one type of liposuction on one side of the body, on one thigh, and a different type on the other? Zero. So that means it's very hard to compare because no one's bothered to do them. And then how many randomized controlled studies? Zero. How many talk about lymphatic sparing liposuction? Oh, three results. None of them related to lipedema. And if you look at skin tightening for lipedema and liposuction, zero. So be careful because there's no science behind a lot of claims that people make. So let's talk about the liposuction options. We've heard the term tumescent. It can be used in two different ways. One of them is tumescent anesthesia or analgesia, where you infiltrate a fluid called tumescent fluid. It makes the tissue firm. It has lidocaine in it, a local anesthetic. It has some epinephrine or adrenaline in it to constrict the blood vessels so you don't bleed and maybe a little bit of bicarb to make it more comfortable. You can do a whole surgery that way. I do mini tummy tucks that way. I do 70% of my liposuction that way. But everybody gets some tumescent fluid, even if they're under general anesthesia, because you gotta put the stuff in, the fluid in with the epinephrine to constrict the blood vessels so you don't bleed, okay? So every, pretty much everybody uses a tumescent technique at some point, whether that's how you get the pain relief done under local anesthetic or whether that's just how you do it, you do it. And then it, all these terms that you guys have been heard tossed around today, SAL, PAL, UAL, VAL, blah, blah, blah. Those are the different types of liposuctions which I'm gonna talk about now. They all can be done awake, they all can be done with minimal incisions, and they all can be done with minimal bruising. But patients with lipedema do tend to bruise more, they tend to have bigger veins and things like that. So there's a lot of mis, uh, misinformation about what can be done awake and what can't, they all can be done awake. And I do all of them, so I'm talking also from personal experience as well as some studies to back it up. So let's talk about traditional liposuction. It's dependable, it's reliable, and it's pretty low cost. You don't have to have a fancy machine to do it. There's no energy. What I'm talking about energy, if you use lasers or high uh, heat producing devices, there is some collateral damage to the tissues. People do stay swollen a little bit longer, they stay firm a little bit longer. With regular liposuction, you don't have to worry about it. And it's relatively low risk. And this, this is used pretty much in all liposuction. Some element of this has to be done to suck the fat out. What you put on the tip of it, whether you put an ultrasound probe or a little stream of water, probably doesn't matter too much. But if you want to make it a little easier on the surgeon, which we do, because we want our surgeons not to tire out, you can put a little motor in the handpiece and it can vibrate or rotate or do whatever it wants to that cannula. That's called power lipo or sometimes vibration lipo. Power sounds, hey, oh, we don't want power, but you know, it sounds kind of scary, but it's a good thing because you can actually move the cannula slower through the tissue as it breaks up the fat. And it's still relatively low cost, no energy damage. It makes the procedure shorter. If you have to pay to get liposuction done and you're doing a surgery center that charges by time, it's better to do the procedure in a faster way and have less anesthesia. And it, it's really good for tough tissue. Someone else already mentioned that. The fibrous tissue comes out very well using power lipo. Ultrasound and Vaser are fairly similar. Vaser is a, just a variation of ultrasound. It's dependable, reliable, but it's a higher cost. These machines cost $100,000 or more, and that cost is going to get passed on to you. 
Um, I think there's some risk for energy damage in these types because that, that's a heat energy or cavitation ultrasound that can cause some damage to the tissue. In good hands, it doesn't, but I've seen some tear. You can look on real self. You can see people burned by laser and uh, invasor when someone's not using it properly. But it requires two parts. You put the ultrasound or vaser in to break up the fat with the sound waves, and then you still have to put in the traditional liposuction, the same old cannula, to pull the fat out. So it's a two-part procedure. It may take a little bit longer. Here's the deal. There's no evidence it's going to tighten the skin, and there's certainly no evidence it's going to tighten the skin in patients with lipedema, which have a different type of skin because it's already been stretched out. And I'll get to the science about that in just a minute. Then there's water-assisted liposuction. So somebody said, hey, take a regular cannula, put a little stream of water on there. A little bit more expensive, not that much more, no energy damage. It makes the procedure longer because you're kind of squirting this water in. Um, it adds, the problem is it adds to that limit of how much volume you're supposed to remove. The 5,000 cc limit, which most of us uh, agree is, is reasonable, includes everything that comes out, not just the fat, it includes the fat and the water, okay? And there's no evidence that it's more gentle, and I'll get to the science behind that also. And there's, fine, there's a laser-assisted liposuction or smart lipo. It's not really smart. It's a good marketing thing, but it's not any smarter. Much more expensive. Possible energy damage. I definitely see patients swell more when I use this. It's a longer procedure because you've got to sit there with this laser before you suck the fat out. And it's three parts. Laser breaks up the fat, kind of. Then you still got to go in with the traditional lipo that I showed you and suck the fat out. And then you go back in to try to tighten the skin. And I'll talk about the skin tightening evidence uh, a little bit later on, but it's never been done on lipedema patients and published, and I don't think it's going to make a difference. So how much fat can be safely removed? There's a number, 5,000 cc's, which is 5 liters, or about 5 quarts, or a little bit more than a gallon that can be safely removed. I was on the patient safety committee who actually wrote that last paper uh, recommending that. That was in 2009. And why did we pick that number? Because the previous committee 10 years before us picked that number. And why did they pick that number? Because they didn't really have a good number and that was kind of floating around out there, okay? So that 5,000 cc limit, which in some states is a law, not all states, but in some states, it's an artificial number, but we thought it's pretty good. Um, and it includes the fat and all the fluid that comes out. So you can play with that a little bit. Um, if it's more than 5,000, the recommendations are the person should be, op should be monitored overnight in a hospital or something like that. So that adds additional cost, trouble, and all that kind of stuff. But there's no evidence to support it. The problem is it, it's really been accepted by most surgery centers, most hospitals. And if someone has a complication and they go over it, then it's kind of hard to defend it too. But is there a limit? So remember I told you I helped start the largest database of plastic surgery cases in the world. And a few years ago, we decided to go look at the numbers. And we have hundreds of thousands of cases. We said, let's look at all the pure liposuction cases and figure out, is this 5,000 cc limit for real? And of course, it's not for real. As you can imagine, the bigger someone is, the higher their body mass index, the more fat you can take out safely. A 100-pound patient removing 2 liters, 2 quarts, that's a big hit. 250-pound patient taking out 2 liters, probably not that big of a deal. The problem, is this hasn't really caught on yet, and it's probably not going to catch on. It's hard to change things. In my surgery center, now they let me do more. I can go up to 6, on a bigger pa six liters on a bigger patient if I want to. But what's the worst thing that can happen? It's typically a seroma. So if you eliminate, which is just a little fluid collection under the skin, which you can drain off with a needle. So I think we can deal with a lot of these things. I think we can push the limit safely when it's done under controlled conditions by experienced surgeons, but it hasn't been accepted yet. Um, let's talk about the lymphatic system. We just heard a talk on lymphatic sparing. Um, I don't want to get into the anatomy of it, but I can tell you the lymphatics are pretty spread out in the legs, but, they, but then they also run along the major blood vessels. I do liposuction at the same time that I do excisional surgery, like thigh lifts, abdominal plasties, and arm lifts. The lymphatics are very hard to injure. As a matter of fact, lymphatic injury after standard liposuction is virtually unheard of. I've never seen it. So the lymphatics are actually pretty resilient. Um, I think when people come and ask me, because I see lipedema patients every week, every month at least, do you do a lymphatic sparing procedure? I don't know how to answer them because there really isn't one, okay? It's, it's kind of this made up term that, I don't know, it kind of gets tossed around. If, if someone knows what they're doing with liposuction, 
they're going to be able to do it without damaging the lymphatics. If, if you give uh, a 10-year-old the liposuction cannula and you tell them to go do something, well, then I, I'm, I'm not really sure that you know, they're going to spare the lymphatics, but we all know how to spare the lymphatics. And this concept came up based on one study many years ago on a cadaver. Okay, So that's where this came from. Somehow it gets tossed around there. If you go to someone who knows what they're doing, I don't think this is really going to be an issue. Um, so let's talk about the clinical studies. So here, this is where it kind of gets interesting. We're making all these great claims based on kind of small numbers. But here's, here's one of the studies that was out there. Pretty much power-assisted liposuction, good results, significant pain and leg volume reduction. Okay, that's pretty good. That's what a lot of patients want. Make the pain better, make my th thighs smaller so I can fit into them. Um, here's a better study, 164 patients. Now we're actually looking at kind of more than just anecdotal, but 164 patients, but here's the important thing. They followed them at least for a year. That's a lot better. And then you know what they did better? They asked the patients what their, report, uh, what their uh, results were. So quality of life kind of things. That is a good study, or at least it's a better study. And again, just like the previous study, what did they use? They used power-assisted liposuction. Nothing too fancy, power-assisted, it works. This is, I think, probably one of the best studies that's out there. They took that same group of patients and then they followed them up for four and eight years. And they looked at it, they asked the patients, did you maintain your improvement? And the majority of the patients said yes. So this study demonstrated long-lasting positive effects of using power-assisted liposuction for lipedema. This is a good study, large number of patients. These are hard to do. It's hard to track patients for beyond a year, believe it or not, and to do a good instrument, uh, a validated instrument for the results. So water-assisted lipo, WAL, body jet, we've heard a lot about that. Here's the study that gets quoted all the time on the superiority of water-assisted liposuction. Here's what they did. They did liposuction with the water lipo, and then they looked at the stuff that came out and they examined it. Okay, that would be like me coming to your house and saying, I'm going to assess the quality of your lawn deep down inside where the roots are by taking a lawn mower and looking at the clippings. Okay, do you realize how silly that is? That's what they did here to say that water lipo is better than all other types of lipo, but they never looked at the other, even looked at the other types of lipo based on a small group of patients. Um, and they did very low volumes. They did volumes that, to me, when I tri treat lipedema patients, are not even practical. Like, I'm not going to take off 1,000 cc's off someone with lipedema. That's a drop in the bucket when I can take out five or six. They had no clinical results. They didn't look at you, look at the patients. All they did was that they looked at the removed fat, and they didn't compare it to anything else. And this is the best evidence that water lipo has, which I think is really useless. I, if this was submitted to me and I was a journal reviewer, I would have rejected it but that's how it is. So let's talk more about this concept of how much fat can be removed. Remember, I told you there's tumescent fluid that goes in. You do that for all cases. It, it prevents bleeding and, and reduces bruising. And then some of it gets sucked out, okay? The ratio of fat to fluid is variable. If I put a lot of fluid in you and I don't wait long enough and I start removing the fat with liposuction, a lot of fluid's gonna come right back out. If I don't put as much in and I wait long enough for some of it to get absorbed, more of the stuff that comes out is going to be fat versus fluid. If I'm doing water lipo and I'm squirting water in as I go, I'm going to pull out more water. If my surgery center or my hospital or my state says I have a 5,000 cc or 5 liter limit, then I'm pulling out a bunch of water that's really not doing you any good. So this is an example of here, on one side I have power lipo, and the other side I have water lipo. The water lipo, removed, they both removed the same amount, but one of them removed twice as much or almost three times as much fat as the other one. So kind of keep that in mind when people tell you you got to be doing water lipo. That may screw up how much fat you're actually removing, and this is kind of where that whole limit comes in. Let's talk about liposuction and skin tightening. A lot of claims made here. <sighs> Vaser, they did make a claim that it, they, their reps are always making claims that it tightens the skin. And I can tell you, I can design a study that'll statistically show you anything you want it. 
statistically. But clinically, that's a different story. So while the VASER study, where they did a split abdomen, did regular lipo on one side, VASER lipo on the other, when they measured these parameters, were able to statistically show a difference. When they asked the patients at three months, can they tell a difference between one half of the abdomen that was done with regular lipo and the other half with the VASER? Guess what they said? They can't. And I can guarantee you, none of these patients were lipedema patients. And I can guarantee you, most of them had pretty good skin to begin with, because that's, I know how these studies are done. That's how I would have done it, right? I'm not going to pick somebody that's not going to get a good result. Then there's laser liposuction. They did the same thing. Barry DiBernardo, he's a friend of mine. We, we, teach, on, um, we teach together on, on some courses. I went and trained with him. His study, again, did a lot of good scientific manipulation based on 10 patients, split the abdomen. Okay, regular lipo on one side, laser lipo on the other. And about a 17% improvement. Out of those 10 patients, two of them didn't even see a difference. And again, these were not people with loose skin. These were people with pretty decent skin to begin with. These were not lipedema patients. So those are the studies on skin tightening. Now, radio frequency is the new one that's out there. I've played with it. I've heard someone talking about it. None of these are done on lipedema patients. Keep that in mind. So, traditional liposuction, good old-fashioned liposuction can still give a good result. If someone's got good skin, they're going to get a good result. So if someone doesn't have good skin or the debulking leaves them with loose skin, they're going to need something else. So this is someone after uh, lipedema patients. This is a patient I didn't even realize she had lipedema until I went and looked back at my, uh, my early, some of my early uh, before and after pictures. Two, two, sta two stages of regular traditional liposuction, but to really get her a good result, I had to do an excisional procedure. So she got a thigh lift and a, and, a, um, and a body lift, and then came back later and had her arms done. But that's the difference you can do if you go to somebody who can actually take the whole thing into account and excise the loose skin and really get you where you want to be. So. Don't fall for the marketing and the hype. Consider the source. There are many low-level uh, publications out there with meaningless studies, meaningless conclusions that are often self-serving. It's the surgeon, not the type of liposuction, okay? If you hire someone to build a house, probably doesn't matter what kind of hammers they bring. It's, the, it's their experience that comes into it. Be prepared for multiple procedures. It's very rarely one that's going to do the trick. And you may need some skin removal or skin tightening afterwards. If you want to download or view the talk, just go to my website, drgatowski.com. Under Four Physicians, there's a pull-down tab, and you can find this talk there. Thank you.